Hi, my name is Emily Weber. I'm a machine learning specialist at Amazon Web Services. And today we're gonna learn about feature engineering. So if you've ever wondered what's the best way to wrangle your pandas data frame, uh, what's the best way to analyze the correlation in your data sets or maybe perform principal component analysis, uh, you'll wanna check out this video. Uh, this is your deep dive. So first, if you are following along, if you have a SageMaker notebook instance that is already launched, I want you to do something. I want you to resize that notebook instance, right? Because the best way to launch a notebook instance initially is to start small. And that's because notebook instances are gonna be up for usually eight plus hours a day. And so you wanna keep your cost down um, by selecting a smaller instance. Here, we're gonna need slightly more processing, right? So this is a, this is a four step flow. Uh, you need to click stop on that notebook instance, right? So just stop that instance. Uh, go ahead and push edit. Uh, when you push edit, you're gonna have a couple options here. I want you to upgrade your EC2 instance. So instead of sticking around in, in that T family, we're gonna go all the way up to an M5 XL that tends to be uh, more processing while still keeping it at a lower dollar value. Uh, if you have a large data set, go ahead and upgrade your EBS volume, right? So that's the actual disk space that's on your notebook instance. Feel free to upgrade that. I, I typically move from five, which is the default, up to 25 gigs. So we'll resize it and then go ahead and push start. And so that is a seven minute process, right? Overall, that, that tends to be a seven minute exercise. Uh, so if, if it's taking some time, um, don't, don't, be, don't be too frustrated there. That's, that's what, what happens. And so uh, commonly, uh, if you're getting a gateway timeout issue on your notebook instance, right? Or if you're getting an error statement that says insufficient memory uh, or not enough disk space, you wanna upgrade your instance, right? You will get those errors because you simply don't have enough bandwidth, RAM or cores uh, or disk uh, in order to, to actually get your job done. So having said that, uh, there are two types of questions that we're gonna think about in feature engineering, right? So if we're, if we're using this little pie chart here as our hypothesis of what machine learning literally is, uh, which is solving use case using a data set and a model, uh, there are two types of questions we wanna think about. One of those is, is a little bit more at the research level that is conceptual. Those conceptual questions are like, well, hey, what's the best way to do this? Uh, why should I do this? What are the implications of this transformation step on our model? Uh, we've also got a lot of stuff down at the practical or developer level where we're thinking, well, you know, how do I literally transform that? How do I actually do this feature engineering? And um, both of those are really helpful questions. So uh, with that being said, we're gonna dive into the data frame, right? Into pandas data frame. So we're gonna import pandas as PD, and then we're gonna read in that file name and convert that into a data frame. Having done that, uh, we can call df.shape, right? That's gonna tell us the number of rows that we have against the number of columns. df.head is gonna let us visually see so we can actually scroll through our data and see what's there. Uh, we need to convince ourselves that the data set actually represents the real world. If you're listening to this and if you want to become a better data scientist, I want you to learn how to be skeptical about your own data, right? We cannot assume that our data set is actually accurate. We can't assume that it's really representative. We need to make sure that that is using the data set itself and, and histograms and plotting is a common way of doing that. Uh, we need to remove outliers in that data set, right? And so uh, people have different ways that they like to do this. There, there are a lot of common techniques out there. Um, essentially, if you're uh, removing a point from your data set, that will impact your model, right? Because your model is not gonna know the difference between an outlier and versus a normal one. So we need to apply uh, typically statistical methods in order to remove those. Uh, we need to combine columns. So in this example, um, the researchers wanted to be able to model who was gonna open up a bank account. And so in order to do that, they thought a relevant column would be whether or not a person was working. And so they actually just combined um, three columns based on the conditional and of an attribute being true, and then rolled that up into a new column. So very, very common technique. You can call that synthetic feature generation. Uh, handling strings. So 
if you're opening up your data set and you realize that one of your columns um, actually has strings in it, uh, usually what that means is that is a categorical column, right? Uh, it, it, can start, it can say fruit, and then you've got apple, watermelon, orange, right? And so essentially what we need to do uh, typically is convert new columns from that. Um, so the technical term for that is one hot encoding, right? And you're gonna use a uh, method that's built into pandas that's called pd.getdummies, right? And that's gonna take your data set along with the columns that you wanna actually transform, and it's gonna explode that out, right? So maybe you started with 24 columns, but then in some cases you can get significantly more. Um, so this is a powerful technique, but you do wanna be a little bit careful uh, about how you actually implement it. Uh, Min-max scaling is a crucial technique. Um, so this is gonna be for your numerical feature set. So if you've got a column that says age or income or potentially time of day, um, not, not necessarily time of day, right? But other, other numerical features that are actually running variables. Uh, typically you're, want, you're gonna wanna use a scaler to bring that back down. My go-to tends to be scikit-learn min-max. Um, so that just keeps the distribution the same, but brings in the min and the max. Other times you will need to actually convert that distribution so it is a little bit more standard. Uh, but in this case, we're gonna leave it uh, having the same distribution just with a min-max scaling. Uh, correlation analysis, so very common technique, right? You're gonna have multiple variables in your data set and you need to figure out if those variables are correlated with the target column that you're actually trying to predict or if they're correlated with the other Xs, right? And all of those will have a pretty significant impact uh, on your model. And so if you need to decorrelate your Xs, right? If you have two columns um, that are actually correlated, you can decorrelate that uh, using principal component analysis. So that's running another technique um, that'll basically identify the underlying principal components that are explaining some of that variation. Uh, principal component analysis is also helpful to reduce dimensionality. So if you're starting with you know, a thousand columns, you wanna bring that down to anywhere from 10 to 100, uh, PCA is gonna be your go-to for that. Uh, data augmentation, right? So if you're in the deep learning world, um, you get to actually augment your data. So in images, that's gonna be cropping, um, changing some of the lighting, changing some of the rotations, and all that basically adds both volume and variety to your data set, which your model's gonna be able to learn from, right? It's gonna like that. Uh, data augmentation is gonna be built into some of the uh, image classification and other algorithms in SageMaker. Uh, using a pre-trained model. So again, if you are in the deep learning world, um, the technique is called transfer learning, right? You can reference a model you previously trained uh, and then basically add layers on top of that, retrain those layers, and then redeploy it and keep running. Uh, so some common steps, right? Just importing pandas SPD, reading your file into memory. Um, you can get your headers just by listing the data frame. Um, you can easily get histograms. Uh, you can easily loop through those rows, right? So for IDX and row and DF.ita rows, you can reference the stuff that's in your rows, um, and then you can update your data frame using DF.iloc. So some other common techniques, uh, if you need to extract uh, data from a data frame, right, that there are queries out there that you can definitely use, uh, whether you're merging, concatting, joining. Um, again, the AWS uh, CLI is always gonna be helpful go to. Uh, and then lastly, for, for one hot encoding, right, please don't write this yourself, right? <laughs> I don't want anyone to, to waste time out there writing their own one hot encoder. Uh, definitely just, just use the one that's built into, into Pandas. Uh, so once you've got a few ETL approaches set up, right? Maybe you're taking uh, transformation strategy A and then you're taking transformation strategy B uh, and maybe you wanna decide which one is ultimately better. Uh, so a common way of comparing approaches is by actually running separate training jobs, right? So go ahead and train the model on ETL strategy A and then train the model on ETL strategy B and objectively determine which one is doing better. A few ways you can determine that objective performance, uh, you can look at accuracy or precision, recall, AUC, right? Any objective metric you're, you're interested in. You can also think about which one takes longer to train. Um, you can also think about which one takes longer to engineer, right? Dev time is expensive, our time is valuable. And so if an ETL strategy that you're doing takes multiple days to write, but is only getting you and maybe one tenth of a percentage point, is it really that valuable? Potentially not. Uh, Git integration, right? Git is crucial here, particularly in the ETL world. Uh, so you're gonna wanna add a Git repository to your notebook. 
um, you're gonna wanna wrap your steps as functions. Um, right, add functions to your Git repository so that you can share your ETL steps across the members of your team. Um, also, uh, you wanna run your ETL in production. And so this, this brings up a topic, right? I think a lot of people in, in data science are, are realizing that this is a, this is a key thing um, that we need, to, we need to really own. Um, we need to think about our ETL as software applications, right? So yes, we are doing analysis, but we're also trying to build applications that are actually gonna add business value. Um, so wrapping your content as functions is gonna make it easier to use and maintain in the long term. Um, you want your code to be modular, right? You want it to be well abstracted, well thought out. You want it to be readable um, so that another person can pick it up and in a few minutes understand what's going on rather than having to dig through every line, right? And you want it to be reusable. So eventually you're gonna be building full scripts that you can then import from to add on top of. All right, uh, one key topic here are inference pipelines. And so this is specific to SageMaker. Um, so let's say I have not just one container, but two, maybe more, right? Maybe I have up to five containers and I wanna run all of those as par in parallel. Um, so using inference pipelines in Amazon SageMaker, I can set this up, right? I can deploy up to five containers as a quote unquote pipeline model. And so my process is gonna run through container one, uh, maybe it's doing some feature transformation, run through container two, maybe that's the PCA, uh, container three is my XGBoost, and then containers four and five are doing pre -pro uh, post-processing and then shooting it on out through the rest of my app. Um, so again, those are gonna run in serial. Um, those containers are gonna be co-located on the same EC2 instance, right? So that's one EC2 instance that's gonna be using one of those containers for any point in time. Uh, and this is one way that you can productionize your ETL code in SageMaker. And so with that, let's check out an example. So over here, uh, again, we are on a SageMaker notebook instance, right? This is in US East One. Uh, this is our testy McTesterson. We're get, getting up here. Uh, so this example is coming from those SageMaker examples, right? So 200 plus notebooks, this is one of them. And so let's, let's check this out. This is an inference pipeline that we're gonna set up with first a scikit-learn transformer and then a linear learner model. And both of those are gonna be stuck together. Uh, so here we go. Uh, this should look very familiar to you, right? SageMaker session default buckets. Uh, then we're gonna do some pre-processing, right? So we pre we'll download uh, this data set here. This is that seashell abalone data set. And then here we go. We'll specify our working directory. Uh, next, we're gonna get a, a scikit-learn script. So here is that script. Let's check it out. So this is a featureizer script. So again, this script is doing feature transformations, right? It is not training a model, it is doing feature transformations. Uh, and let's check this out. This has uh, image store, right? So it's actually storing uh, small sets of data in this. And by set, I just mean uh, variables, right? So we have the, the column names, right? So the header is stored up here. We know which one is our label column. Uh, we know the, the data types of those feature columns. And so up here, uh, same flow, we're gonna set our arc parser, uh, read through those input files, uh, get that raw data that's coming in. And then let's check this out. So the numeric features, right, are down here. And then we're gonna set up a scikit-learn pipeline, right? And so the scikit-learn pipeline is gonna do two things. Uh, first, it's imputing missing values using the median. And that's right here then it is scaling the numerical values using the scalar, right? Then we have a couple categorical features. And so we're gonna add those to the pipeline, right? So additional pipelines uh, is gonna be this simple imputer, right? That's, that's filling in the categorical missing values. Uh, then we're gonna do one hot encoding here. Uh, so again, one hot encoding with that pd.getdummies, but this is all handled for us by scikit-learn. Uh, I've got a couple other transformers we want to do. And then this can be counterintuitive, right? So this is actually saying preprocessor.fit. Uh, and then it's going to be writing this as a model. So again, this is not a uh, formal machine learning model, right? There's, there's no uh, predictive content that's going on over here. In this case, there are a handful of feature transformation steps. And we're going to wrap those feature transformation steps as a scikit-learn preprocessor. 
There we go. Couple other functions. Uh, input function here is gonna take the raw data um, on the prediction side and convert that to a data frame. And then the output function um, is gonna loop through uh, our instances and then append it. There we go. And so that is calling model.transform on that input data. And so the model here, and again, that is a feature engineering model, right? That's not a machine learning model, but that is a feature engineering model. Uh, there we go. And so let's let's finish this out just to, to see how this actually works. All right, so back here in the rest of our notebook, uh, we'll set up this container, right? And so that's again, scikit-learn uh, estimator with that abalone featureizer. Right, and that is fitting the preprocessor. Right, and so that is the preprocessor that's training. And so that's running on a training job. Then down here, um, we're gonna run batch transform on that. Okay, uh, then we're gonna fit the linear model with the preprocess data. Um, so we'll take in our SageMaker estimator, right? We've got one M42XL, okay? Set our hyperparameters, call fit. Then we're gonna set up an inference pipeline. And so again, that's that pipeline model that takes a model name. All right, and we've got our inference pipeline that's coming up over here. So the scikit-learn inference model happens here. The linear model happens here. And so the pipeline model is literally a list of models, right? Pretty intuitive. Um, so we're calling it an inference pipeline. It's got a role and then it just has a list of models and then we deploy it. And so we can just deploy up to five models. And then we can also send requests to that. And so this is with having it deployed as an endpoint. And so again, that is serializing up to five containers um, that are gonna run one after the other. Let's switch back. And so some pro tips just to close this out. Again, versioning, super helpful. Um, definitely so you're, you're holding on to your ETL code after you've written it, you can share it. Uh, resizing that notebook on the fly, definitely helpful. Um, running multi-processing for future transformation, right? So on your notebook instance, you can utilize all those cores. And then lastly, you just wanna think about your Docker container. And so with that, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this session. Uh, my name is Emily Weber. I'm a machine learning specialist at Amazon Web Services and you should have a good day.